You Dive better jump on the personal brand train or you're gonna get decimated, ladies and gentlemen. Probably the fourth wave at some point will be the rise of AI, maybe the end of human, so we don't have to worry about it. <laughs> it won't be important. <laughs> but until that happens, for the next, you know, decades, it's gonna be the rise of the individual. So even if you have a corporation or an LLC and product, founder-led brands are winning. Yeah, the mistake of 90% of personal brands is like, Ty, I'm good on so many subjects. I know a lot of things. I'm gonna just talk about life. And I mean, when I started as a personal brand, 2009, I started uploading. I mean, I posted on Instagram, uh, Twitter on 2007, I just looked. But I really started focusing on it in 09. Okay. Back then, wasn't many personal brands, you know? There was more like Hollywood brands and stuff. So mm. I kind of could go, but even then I went small. I was a, I was a book brand, I summarized books versus people now are like, oh, I'm just gonna vlog my life. I'm like, no. So build <laughs> build your, there's a, I use a framework called the Eulerian Destiny. It's spelled like Eulerian Destiny, which basically says mm. you draw four circles where they all intersect. That's your personal brand. So one of the circles, and I actually have a fifth circle now, but I'll just stick with the old school. Uh, question number one is, what do you talk about with your friends when you're not working on a Saturday night, just chilling? So that's you draw whatever subjects you try, you draw there. All right. Then you ask, what did your parents and ancestors do? Grandparents. Genetics is a big part of success. So you got to know what you're genetically pre-framed for. Then you draw another circle, which is what you've been doing the last five or 10 years. Ideally, you base, you build off of momentum you already have. And then, you know, the fourth one is, what do your enemies compliment you on? Because enemies tell the truth more than family and friends. <laughs> oh, I bet. Nietzsche said, the mind is an <laughs> impenetrable fortress. You learn about yourself through friends and enemies. Uh -huh. So the fourth one, then where do they all converge? Like for me, my, even my enemies will be like, ah, oh, I don't like Ty Lopez. He's just a good marketer. So mm -hmm. if your enemies are saying, I don't like you, but they're not giving me a frivolous com compliment, you know? So yeah. that would be, so marketing I'd put there. Then what do I talk about on a Saturday night with my friends? I like to talk actually about psychology a lot. Um, the science of human, the human mind. Then my ancestors, I have, my grandpa was a scientist on my mom's side. Um, and he was a scientist at Yale, he taught there. And then my grandma's dad, was kind of one of the first psychoanalysts in the Freudian Jung school, and he was born a long time ago. So uh, there's an interest in my genes is interested in figuring things out, teaching too. Hmm. And then, you know, what I've been doing the last 10 years, even before I started my personal brand, I had a financial planning company where I was teaching and educating people on financial planning. So when you put all those together, my personal brand where those intersected was clearly something along what I built my brand, which in that case was about intellectual books, what I'm reading, what I'm learning in my books, you know? And that's how I started my brand. Education built around, books. I talked a lot about psychology too. I talked about the 25 cognitive biases. So hmm. let's do the, let's do it for you. So what, All right. what have you been doing successfully the last 10 years? Um, in business, right? It can be anything in life for men. A lot of times, I think business. mine would be um, networking with people. And what about what made you your moolah? Oh, martial arts schools. So I ran martial arts businesses and real estate. Real estate. Yeah. So okay, we pick one of those. What do you talk about when you're not working with friends on a? By the way, this over here is a oats field just planted. Joe, oh, wow. that's coming through. Yeah, I was telling them, uh, I want to do a farm the more I'm here, because the real yeah. estate farm would be the next thing for me, for sure. So what do you yeah. talk about, the other circle, what do you talk about when you're alone or just with a couple friends having um, drinks? Honestly, I'm talking about, um, honestly, kind of helping people, so helping others. I used to be a full-time missionary. Okay. So we talk about what we could do to help other people. Okay. Um, I, so I'm very passionate about that. Okay. Family, so preparing for the future too. So okay. can I, I want to be there for my family. Okay. Um, really travel and goals. Okay. Yeah. So we're trying to find what the circles have in common. So I would say 
real estate, helping people, okay. All then right. what did your parents and grandparents do? Well, my dad was uh, from Korea, so he did martial arts schools, okay. and he was a good leader. So he was real good at uh, helping other people get into the martial arts business okay. and grow. So he was very, he was kind of like the grand master. Okay. So that's what he did. Guru kind of uh, thing. Yeah, my mom, she was just very supportive. Um, and she liked to help people. She was also, also a missionary. But go to grandparents. I think a lot of times people have tension with mm -hmm. their parents. There's, it's one of my mentors, Robert Trivers, became famous for a paper on parent-child conflict. We often think parent-offspring. Uh, okay. So what did your grandparents right, do? My grandfather, he was an inventor. Okay. He had a high IQ of like 160, 170. So right. he was a very smart guy. Yeah. Um, that's on my mom's side. My grandmother, she was actually just a stay-at-home mom, and she was okay. good to nurture the family. Yep. And then on my dad's side, my dad's dad was a judo master, so okay. martial arts similar to my dad. Okay. And his wife, she just took care of the family. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, martial they got real estate and martial arts and helping people. Yeah. And then the, uh, what do your enemies say, compliment you, or, or family members when they're mad at you? Like when your mom's mad at you, she's like, ah, you're such a this. That's probably the truth. Uh, oh, gosh. What do, that, I, that I overwork and that whenever I want to do something, I almost have an obsessive personality in learning it to make sure I do it good. Okay. So you like uh, to learn. Yeah, I do. So let me ask you, why don't you go harder on this martial arts school idea yeah, and we'll, build a big franchise and franchise it globally? Yeah, so we went to six schools, and then when I got more into real estate, I realized um, it's harder to grow up black belts, you know, because we have to have them with us for about three to five years or seven years before we can get them into another school. So it's harder to, to scale quickly, to, to stay at our standard and with our curriculum. Okay. It's like a schooling. So that was a little harder to scale. Okay. Yeah. And then um, the real estate, the reason why I did mix it with martial arts is... Um, I was able to buy the building, so that's how I got into commercial gotcha. real estate. Yeah, the oats is starting. There you go, Joe. Look at that. It's all just starting to come up. It's only like nine days ago we planted. That whole field when you come will be about this tall. Knock on wood. I think your personal brand should be around teaching people. To me, teaching real estate. If you like that better, it's teaching, helping. It's got to be something you have. Nobody wants to listen to somebody who doesn't have. In general, men listen to men who were good hunters. So what did you make a lot of money in? People will listen. Even mm. your enemies will listen if you made money. Yeah. So I think building around what you've learned in real estate, and real estate is easy. Dude, you can monetize the hell out of real estate. Like, you can get rich mm -hmm. off real estate education. It's crazy. Well, that's why I feel good, because I get to help people too. Yeah. kind of do what I've already done. Yes. I was able to do it with no money and do things creatively. Yep. You harvest the corn in the fall. We pick it, take the corn, feed the animals mm. off, leave. You can leave the corn in the field as a cover crop. It dies, it covers the field. Then in the winter, we plant oats. And uh, then that plant in like March and you harvest that in August. Then you let it lay fallow for a month or two so the mm. weeds grow then you kill it and you plant wheat with alfalfa underneath it as a nurse crop wow. and then in the July of the next year you harvest off the oats uh, the wheat mm -hmm. and underneath it is the alfalfa that'll then stay for five years oh wow how long have you been farming I started when I was a 19 oh, Joel wow. Salatin yeah that's something people don't know about me I know People, my, one of my business partners was like, Ty, I think you're the only dude in the world that knows how to plant oats <laughs> and knows how to make money online. It's not a huge circle. I got to learn, and I lived with the Amish for two and a half. I spent about five years learning from mentors about agriculture. Mm. I thought I, I wasn't sure I'd ever use it. Now the world's gonna run out of food, at least good food. Everybody's growing nasty food now, so. So you eat your own cup, do you sell any of them or do you? Yeah sell beef pork i'm getting ready to ramp up i've been so busy i'm gonna ramp this business up a lot so mm. i did a partnership with joel salatin my mentor my first mentor when i was a teenager how did you meet joel i met him my stepdad read his book good old books books will lead you to the promised land man mm. you're a christian right i am so 
there's a lot of religions based around the book. The Christians believe in the book. Jews are the book. Muslims are about the book. Confucians kind of have, maybe it's not a book, but it's kind of like a book. Buddhists. Everybody has a book. Bhagavad Gita. Maybe not Native Americans. <laughs> but, yeah, it's... Uh, Books will lead you good places, man. As long as you read the right ones. There's too many now. There's something like, some people will say there's as many as 100 million books have been published, but for sure, let's say 30 million. And uh, so you gotta be picky. Do you still read a book a day? Yeah, I try to. Today I'm reading an interesting book. My book of the day is this one on narcissism. Rethinking Narcissism by Dr. Craig Malkin. Craig Malcolm the positive thing. There are some positive attributes. That's why evolution still has, anything that has no positive, they call <laughs> it externalities or adaptive purposes will disappear. So being a little bit narcissistic is okay. Mm. Leaders are usually more narcissistic, confident people. You think most of the successful people are narcissistic? Yeah, but usually there's levels, one to a hundred. You know, if you're like 80 or 90 or 100, then your narcissism is so high, it starts to become dysfunctional again. So mm. you want to be, like Buddha said, the middle way. It's kind of like muscles. It's like dudes, if you have no muscle, you're de-optimized. If you have just insanely weird amount of muscle, you're also de-optimized. Uh, so there's a perfect balance. Yeah, the middle way. Yeah. Most men can add about 30 pounds of good muscle healthily, which is a lot. I mean, the average height size mm. guy can add 20 to 30 pounds of good, uh, as an adult, lean muscle and maintain it. If you go on gear, steroids, some dudes are adding, you know, 60 pounds of muscle, mm. but it starts getting too much. This pond's nice here. There's a Canadian goose living out here. I built an island so they could protect from all the predators. <laughs> so sure enough. Look at that view. I think it's neat that you come from like the city, so you have the extreme one end and yeah. the extreme other end, that's cool. But that's kind of like my, you know, genetics. Look at the deer up there, there's two. We're oh, disturbing wow. them eating on the top of the hill up there. There's paused. <laughs> this, this farm, I have some of it in conservation, so we have tons, there's sometimes like, 20 to 60 D are out in my fields. Sometimes it's too many eating oh, my crops. Wow. Yeah, there's like four over there. I try to, I learned from Joel Salatin, you try to build a biodiverse farm so it's not just grass. Some people think all trees is good. Mm -hmm. Trees aren't necessarily better for the environment than other. The best is what's called edge. So where you meet, where water meets grass meets trees, that's where the most biodiversity is. Oh, wow. So it's actually, some people, that don't know what they're doing want to plant trees in the whole world. That's not the solution. In fact, grass can build soil fertility faster than trees. Hmm. The most fertile places in the world developed under grass. So the Midwest of US, a lot of Canada, the Pampas of, uh, of Argentina, Ukraine, all the fertile places, most of them. Some fertile places like in Europe developed under trees, but a lot of it developed under grassland. Hmm. So you need did y'all build this pond? Yeah, I built this, yeah. This is super good for the environment. It, it changes the diversity completely. Mm. And it also, if you don't have this here, and that'll start to dry up in the summer. Those deer don't have anything to drink. But now they have a huge one acre. That never goes dry. Wow. So, and then there's fish in there. Bears come, bald eagles come through here and fish. I got two bald eagles. They come on and off. Killed, I had 70 chickens out free ranging. They'd eat one every other day. I ended up with 30. <laughs> You're not allowed to shoot bald eagles in America. You're better off to shoot a human than shoot a bald eagle in America, boy. They do not. <laughs> There's like, the law is so intense. So it just, I had to just sacrifice my poor chickens. Oh my God. Because it's hard. What? Falcon yeah, falcons though are not quite as aggressive. All right, let's head back. Did you say that you had a fish farm there too? Well, we've, yeah, we've, put, we've grown, one of my farm managers used to farm fish in there. Um, right now there's just natural fish, but no, we're not farming it. All right. Yeah. Go back this way here. This will <laughs> be a good lifestyle podcast. I like these kind of podcasts. They're more unique. 
Yeah, so you need to really double down on building out your personal brand. Like personal brand, people don't realize we're in the, I wrote a book called The Three Trends. And the third trend, the three trends of wealth creation in history, we're in the third trend, which is the rise of the individual personal brand. Hmm. The first trend was the rise of government and military wealth. If you look back the last 500 years, people 500 years ago, the way you got wealthy was you aligned yourself with a government or a military like Christopher Columbus, Pizarro, you know, they came and conquered with a government and military behind them. And that's how you became wealthy or else you had to be born wealthy. Uh, so it's the ro royalty, governments, military. Then the third, the second trend happened starting around, depends on where you want to, if you want to count what day of the industrial revolution, but you had the rise of corporations, the East, the Hudson Bay Company, the East Indian Company, you know, Rockefeller's trusts, Standard Oil. So that was, you know, 17, 1800s into the 1900s, IBM, faceless mass corporations. And now, the last 20 years, it's the third trend is the rise of personal brands. So it, now, and you, now it's everybody like ChatGBT, that corporation, the founder is now putting his face in front of it. Elon Musk is putting his individual face in front of Twitter, mm. X in front of Tesla, in front of SpaceX to give himself an edge because humans, really the third trend has always been the best trend, but it has only been enabled with the rise of smartphones that people could, you could instantly, now 3 billion people have, Access. have yeah, high speed internet or some level of internet. Mm. So the third trend is the trend and it's still early. You know, I, I remember starting in 2009, I remember I, I found my first, I call this the beginning of my personal brand in 09 because really I had MySpace, but, and I was on a TV show in 2007 called Millionaire Matchmaker. So I had a personal brand really, and I, I built a nightclub business, but the rise of kind of YouTube had an app in 09. And I have a video I found with my buddy Zach outside the Laugh Factory Comedy Club <laughs> in Hollywood. And I'm like, look, Zach, I'm going to shoot this video. And there's a new crazy thing from YouTube. I can just upload it right here while we're at the, while we're at the comedy club. And he's like, really? So that's 09. I remember thinking that I was late back then. I was like, oh, I'm too late. But, you know, I, I had a, now there's 5 million podcasts estimated. Wow. When I started, there was like 500. And I thought I was late. So... It's not late now, but it's getting later by the day. So I just tell people, you Dying better jump now. on the personal brand train or you're gonna get decimated, ladies and gentlemen. Mm. Let's build your personal brand. And it's a wave, probably the fourth wave at some point will be the rise of AI, which may be the end of humans, so we don't have to worry about it. <laughs> it won't be important. <laughs> but until that happens, for the next you know decades, it's gonna be the rise of the individual. So even if you have a corporation or an LLC and product, you founder-led brands are winning. You see even Mark Zuckerberg now coming back, rebranding himself, posting more. He's you know Jiu -jitsu. doing jujitsu, challenging Elon <laughs> Musk. I told everybody, Joe, my buddy Joe's almost a brown belt in jujitsu. I'm a blue belt. And uh, when I saw Mark Zuckerberg, I guess I went live. I don't remember this, but Somebody's like, Ty, you called it. They're like, what do you think, Ty, is gonna happen with this Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg fight? I said, it will never happen. They're like, why? I said, guaranteed, these mofos get hurt in training. <laughs> sure enough, I forgot I said that. Three or four months later, somebody sends me a picture of Mark Zuckerberg <laughs> in a hospital bed with a torn uh, ACL. I'm like, bro, you ain't sitting in no computer seat. <laughs> like Zuckerberg and, and Elon did for 30 years and just popping up and doing jujitsu. I'm like, there ain't no way. So sure enough, that fight ain't gonna happen. Yeah. That's why I say you gotta keep yourself active. Body is use it or lose it, baby. Now you told me, uh, you know, like personal brand's important. and um, Not just important, it's now death or life. <laughs> it's death or life of your long-term financial future. Yeah, you said you uh, you went to the movies one time and someone didn't know who Elon Musk was oh, a yeah. couple years ago. That was 2014. I posted, I got a funny picture. It's actually, if you Google it, Ty Lopez, Elon Musk. I've done, I've, I've met up with him many times uh, mm -hmm. at 
well, not many, but multiple times in Hollywood. He, he liked to go. I would end up at the same events. But first time I met him, I was at the Grove. I was dating this woman named Kenna. And uh, there was, it was like a Monday night, so nobody was there. It was like 10 or, I was a night owl at that time, 10 or 11 at night. Apparently Elon is too. And I'm sitting, I only knew Elon because I went to this, in 2012, a guy goes, you want to go to this little fireside chat with this guy? Elon Musk. I'm like, who the hell is that? He was only pretty much known in Hollywood. I mean, in uh, San Francisco. Oh, wow. So I had heard vaguely, but I'm like, who is that again? So I went and heard him, hear him talk. That's like 2011 or 12. And then a couple years later, I'm at the Grove and I'm like, there's a dude here. I remember he's ordered like four hot dogs, three or four hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Just he's like hot dogs, popcorn. He ain't the healthiest eater. And I was like, and the girl who's taking the order, no idea who it is. I'm like, Kenny, you know who that is? She's like, that's this guy. I think he was a billionaire by then. Elon, she's like, I'm like, let's go talk to him. So I asked him, I asked him. It was interesting, my first question was, how'd you learn how to build spaceships? Because that's not your training. He's like, I bought books. <laughs> He's like, I bought a textbook on aerospace engineering and I started teaching myself. So when people tell me, Todd, you don't need books. I'm like, let me ask you a question, dipshit. Are you smarter than Elon Musk? Okay, then shut the fuck up because Elon told me he <laughs> that's how he figures stuff out. <laughs> People are too cocky. Oh, I don't need books. Well, the richest man in the world said he needed them. That was good enough for me. He was going into the movie finally after he talked for a couple minutes. And I go, what do you think of the BMW i8? Because that was the dominant electric car. Mm. Remember, I don't know why he said it. He goes, it's i8. And he went in the movies, and I was like, that was a strange conversation. <laughs> now but, I don't know uh, why. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the rise of the personal brand, you know, it matters. It mattered. Donald Trump became president of the United States. Love him or hate him, he outmaneuvered the personal brand of Hillary Clinton. 2016, you know. I saw it coming. I'm not even good at predicting politics, but that one, I said, wait a second. Hillary, I had interviewed Hillary before too. Wow. She's not super, I think she's very intelligent, but she's not naturally sociable and likable. Mm. And I would see their Twitter, Trump would post in 2015, 80,000 likes. Hillary, 18,000. I said, I think this thing's gonna be determined. That's kind of like votes. Yeah. Likes are votes in the democratic process however it flawed it is of social media. And so, and so Trump was a more compelling personal brand. Love him or hate him, however you wanna dissect it, whatever side of the aisle you're on, he won. And a man with no political background, no real political support, outmaneuvered a whole Washington DC infrastructure that's been there for hundreds of years. That's yeah. the power of the brand. In fact, in some ways, Donald Trump is, has been ahead of his time. He's been branding Trump hotels, Trump steaks, Trump <laughs> water, Trump models, was a big model agency for years. So <clears throat> Hillary just wasn't as strong of a personal brand. Mm. You know, we'll see what happens this year. Hard to know, but Trump is the strongest brand has ever been. Have you ever met Trump? Uh, no. It's funny, I was supposed to, years ago, my friend Hal did business, did a lot of, owned a lot of the Trump licenses for the state of California. I never checked my voice memos, and he had left me a voice memo. Ty, I'm at a club in LA. It's me and Donald Trump, wanna come? I heard it like two weeks after he left it. I'm like, damn it. <laughs> I always wonder, what would have happened if I had answered my phone? Of course, he, Hal was old school, he wouldn't text. Nor, I'm like, why are you leaving me a voice memo? And he left me two voicemails. The second one was like, we're going on his jet to Vegas. Come, it's just us two. Oh. And so that was a missed opportunity. <laughs> so the moral of the story is, turn your fucking ringer on. <laughs> Golly. Check your voicemails. <laughs> or get your friends to text you. I told him, how, ever anything important, can you just text me like a normal person? Or tell my assistant, so still tell you. <laughs> no, just text. If you had text, I, everybody checks text, but he's kind of old school. But I never met Trump after that. Yeah, you know, Hal Ornstein. Mm. I always, Hal was on the inaugural stage when he won. It's pretty cool. 
Oh, wow. Yeah, it's pretty, they're pretty close. Pretty close. We'll see if Trump's personal brand is when strong is enough. I wouldn't count, I'm not great at predicting political, I don't like politics much. Yeah. But I wouldn't count that man out. Biden, I'm not sure what planet he's on. Biden may have already left Earth. <laughs> he's no longer with us. He's being propped up by AI cyborg. <laughs> he's an AI cyborg that looks tired. <laughs> but you know Biden, as much as a lot of my followers hate him, and I'm not a big fan, he uh, somehow magically became the most powerful man on Earth. Mm. My mom says it's the deep state. The deep state. My mom's very much a believer <laughs> in the deep state. We met your mom, she was really sweet. Yeah, my mom, my mom, all conspiracy theories my mom likes. <laughs> you can just create one. Socks are a conspiracy theory of the interstate, my mom would be like, inner circle, I mean, uh, deep state, my mom would be like, I can see that. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that, that's possible. My mom's smart, but she just loves conspiracy theories. She's an Aquarius, she says, that's why. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they like aliens. Well, we made it back home. Time to eat. More important than podcasts, food. <laughs>